Christ is risen. I invite you to stand as you are able and turn to face the baptismal font at the entrance to our sanctuary as we begin our worship this morning with the brief order for confession and forgiveness as you find that printed in your bulletin or as you see it on the screen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake. God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing our gathering song, Christ is Alive, Let Christians Sing, hymn number 389. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. 
for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and blessing and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing and honor and glory and might be to be with you. with you. The prayer for this second Sunday of Easter is found printed in your bulletin. You'll also see it on the screen. We pray together. Let us pray. Almighty God, with joy we celebrate the day of our Lord's resurrection. By the grace of Christ among us, enable us to show the power of the resurrection in all that we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our children's ministry director, Beth, has a word for the kids and all of us via the video screen, to which you would turn your attention now, please. Well, good morning, everybody, and happy Sunday to you today. On the calendar behind us, you will notice that we are in the season of Easter, and that the color for Easter is white. I wanted to check in with you this morning to ask, do you remember what you say when somebody says, Christ is risen? He is risen indeed. Okay, so that's what we say. He is risen indeed. So uh, listen up, because I think you'll probably hear somebody say that later this morning. So be sure you're ready to respond, okay? Our Bible story this morning is Doubting Thomas, and I'd like you to help me tell the story this morning. So whenever you hear me say the word believe, I want you to make this motion. You know, kind of like the kid from Home Alone. Okay, so when you hear me say the word believe, I want you to make that motion, okay? All right, here we go. On the evening of the first Sunday after Jesus had been crucified, his disciples were together in a locked room. They were afraid of those who had crucified Jesus. Suddenly, Jesus appeared there in the locked room with the disciples. It was hard to believe. But they saw him, and Jesus showed them his wounds in his hands and at his side, so they knew it was him. One of the disciples, Thomas, was not with the others when Jesus appeared to them. When they told Thomas he didn't believe it, he had, he had seen Jesus crucified and buried. 
how could he be alive? Thomas said, unless I see the wounds on his side and put my fingers in the holes where the nails were in his hands, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were in the locked room again, and this time Thomas was with them. Again, Jesus came and stood among the disciples. Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas fell on his knees and answered Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, you and I have never seen Jesus with our own eyes. The question is, will, be, will we be one of those who is blessed because we believe even though we haven't seen? Okay, you can stop making the motion now. Thank you for helping me to tell the story. Let's close out with prayer today. Dear God, help, uh, help turn our doubts into faith. We can't see you with our own eyes, but please help us to live so that others will see you in us and our actions and believe. And all God's children say, Amen. Thank you very much, everybody. A uh, quick reminder, we do have Kids Zone this Wednesday from 1 until 5, so I'll see those kids um, then. Otherwise, I'm going to see the rest of you right back here next time. Bye for now. Have a great week. The first lesson is from Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, the fourth chapter. It can be found on page 888 of your Pew Bible. While the apostles testified to others about the resurrection of Jesus, the early Christian community shared what they owned or sold their possessions to help their fellow believers who were in need. The reading. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The word of the Lord.
The second lesson is from the first letter of John, the first chapter, and can be found on page 989 of your Pew Bible. The opening of this letter serves as a reality check. The reality of God is light, but our confessed reality has been sin. God cleanses us from our sinful reality through Christ's death so that we live in fellowship with Christ and walk in God's light. The reading. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you that we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing, the, writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and we do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Chapter two, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you're able for the gospel acclamation. Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked, for fear of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, Put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side. I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Now, although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did these and many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, 
and that through believing you may have life in his name. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. I would like to read for you uh, right now the psalm that is assigned for this second Sunday of Easter. We didn't read it in the context of our regular lesson readings, but it's a good one. Psalm 133. Listen. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. Now, if you were to look up that psalm in your Bible, you'd see that that psalm has a heading, and it reads, A Song of Ascent." a sense. And that means that it was intended for use by religious pilgrims who were making their way, they were ascending to the temple in Jerusalem for worship. See, the temple sat on an elevated plain, uh, the road winding up to it, and then steps leading up into that holy space. And it was designed as a place, of course, not only for fellowship with the divine, but also for fellowship with God's people, you know, with your fellow worshipers. The blessing of being in one in spirit, one in faith, one in hope was like God's own anointing, like Moses' brother Aaron being chosen for that holy task of helping to deliver God's people from bondage. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. Unity of what? Exactly. That's the question. Huh? Imagine if you would, hundreds, maybe thousands of people coming into that temple on any given day, any given week, not only from the city of Jerusalem, but from all the far-flung corners of Israel and Judah. Different currencies, right? Different idiosyncrasies different dialects, depending on how far north or south or east or west these people were coming from, probably lots of differing opinions on local and national governance, not to mention the Roman occupation. So much difference, so much, and yet one in what? Probably not one in mind, huh? probably not one in custom, but one in faith, in trust, that here in this place all were children of the God who delivers from bondage. One in trust, one in faith, one in hope. And apparently when that happens, whenever that happens, the dividing walls of fear and suspicion are breached. And to quote the psalm, it is a blessing. Life forevermore. In other words, life in all of its fullness, life as it was intended. Dare I say, happiness. Happiness. What is happiness? How would you define it for yourself? Perhaps a feeling of contentment? Or is it something stronger? Happiness. Satisfaction, joy, bliss, ecstasy. It's hard to pin down exactly what happiness is except to say that we kind of know it when we feel it, right? I've been thinking a lot about happiness this last week because I'm currently in, in the middle of reading a book called A Geography of Bliss, One Grump's Search for the Happiest Places in the World. It's written by a guy named Eric Weiner. You see, apparently there are people, serious scientists, social scientists, studying the whole concept of happiness. And while it's incredibly difficult to nail down a precise definition of what it means to be happy, it turns out it's not all that hard 
to measure. You simply ask people, are you happy? <laughs> and they'll tell you if they are or aren't. And then maybe you can begin to identify what it is that makes them happy. There's a college in the Netherlands uh, where Dr. Ruth Vinhoven is, being, uh, is doing just this. He is uh, overseeing a project called the World Database of Happiness. And by interviewing thousands of people all in countries all across the world, he and his associates have been at work identifying where happiness seems to thrive and where it does not. It's not always where you might expect, by the way. Um, I won't run down the happiness rankings for you by country this morning. I want to get through the book first. But in my reading last night, I came upon a passage that kind of stood out to me. Um, the author was in a country called Bhutan. Have you heard of Bhutan? It's a small, um, relatively poor country in the Himalayan mountains, not all that far from Nepal. And it ranks really high in uh, Wienhoven's happiness database. They didn't get television there until 1999. One reason, they're probably really happy people, right? Um, but there's like one major paved road that goes through the country and it used to have a traffic light in the middle of the capital city, but they took it down, the traffic light, because people missed the traffic guard with his white gloves directing traffic and doing all the fancy moves out there. So they just took the traffic light down. Anyhow, this road running through the country in many places is only wide enough to let one vehicle through at a time. And the way that they do it, they don't travel slow. These people drive like crazy. But the way it works is um, drivers communicating with oncoming vehicles via hand signals regarding who's going to let who go next, you know, and who's going to pull over. And it works, unbelievably. It works because of trust. Trust that in those small little negotiations uh, with your fellow travelers, you're trusting that they don't want to crash every bit as much as you would like not to crash either, right? And it works. And in reflecting on this whole notion of trust, the author writes this. He says, trust, apparently, is a prerequisite for happiness. Trust not only of your government, of institutions, but trust of your neighbors. Several studies, in fact, have found that trust more than income or even health, is the biggest factor in determining our happiness. <laughs> Trust, more than income, more than even your health, is the biggest factor in determining our happiness. Huh, that's interesting. That would seem to indicate that distrustful people tend to be a lot more grumpy. You think that's true? Hmm. And I think this is all an interesting lens through which to read the scriptures that are appointed for this second Sunday of Easter. In the Gospel of John, we just heard the story of Thomas. You got to hear it twice today, right? Once from Beth and once from me. Thomas, who I think we could label distinctly unhappy, right? At least at the beginning of the story. Who was unable to believe Jesus defeated death until he sees it for himself, right? Now, it's interesting that the Greek text does not say that Thomas doubted. Isn't that amazing? The Greek word is different for doubt than the word used here. Rather, Thomas was without faith, apistos. Belief, you see, is an intellectual exercise. It's something we do up here. And the opposite of belief is doubt, right? Faith the Greek word is pistos, is relational. Faith's corollary is trust. In the Greek, Jesus says to Thomas, don't be untrusting, but rather trust. Hmm. The Easter effect is when untrusting disciples suddenly, inexplicably, gracefully are given the ability to trust. And where could this trust take them? What would it do to them? Well, 
that second lesson that you heard, or the first lesson that you heard read today from the book of Acts gives us a glimpse. Listen to this again. Pay attention through that lens of trust. Now, the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul. No one claimed private ownership of anything, any possessions, but everything they owned, they held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord, and great grace was upon them all. There wasn't a needy person among them. For as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and they laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was even a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And he sold a field that belonged to him, brought the money, laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, it seems here that the Easter effect is a bunch of people placing their trust somewhere other than in what they own or what they consume. They're placing their trust where? In God who defeats death and then placing that trust in their neighbors, right? Who believe like they do. Hmm. Now, here's the next part of that story that you didn't hear read today, but it is so important and it is so good. Listen to this. But a man named Ananias with the consent of his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property. With his wife's knowledge, he kept back some of the proceeds and brought only part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter said, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, didn't it remain in your own? And after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it then that you contrived this deed in your heart? You didn't lie to us, but you lied to God. And now when Ananias, Ananias heard these words, he fell down and he died. And great fear seized all who heard it. The young men came and wrapped up his body, then carried him out and buried him. And after an interval of about three hours, Ananias' wife came in, not knowing what had happened to him. Peter said to her, Tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. And then Peter said to her, how is it that you've agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will now carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. And when the young men came in, they found her dead, so they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard of these things. Hmm. Now, I'm sure many a joke has been cracked about using this story for the church's next stewardship appeal, right? <laughs> um, fair warning of what might happen if you don't pony up. But in all seriousness, there is something going on here in this story that is deep. Luke remember, who wrote the book of Acts. It's kind of a sequel to his gospel. Yeah, I think it's trying to show us the effect that Easter had on the first believers. Luke, if you will recall, was not an economist. What was his profession? Do you remember? He was a physician. Luke was a physician. He was a doctor, which means he was most likely very concerned with the health and the wholeness of people. And you see that shot through his gospel, right? The way Jesus is constantly healing and feeding and mending and uplifting broken, battered people, turning things all upside down, surprising folks with radical grace. That's all in Luke's gospel. Now, because of who Luke was as a physician, I find it kind of unlikely that in this story... In the fourth chapter of Acts, that he's simply trying to promote a model of collective socialist economic policy as opposed to some kind of free market capitalist thing or whatever. We'll let others debate about that, okay? What seems to be evidenced here in this story is what I've been calling the Easter effect. Because this group of people actually trusted that Jesus defeated death, see? All of a sudden... They weren't afraid of it anymore. And so they got brave. Brave enough to feel that they didn't have to hang on for dear life 
to their physical possessions in order to kind of hedge their bet against some grim future. Brave enough to share what they had, trusting in God's keeping and trusting in their fellow believers who felt the same freedom from death's stranglehold, you see. Ananias and Sapphira had a really, really hard time trusting that death had no hold over them. If they trusted it, maybe they wouldn't have been so reticent about letting go of that asset because their trust would have been placed elsewhere, right? It would have been placed in the God of the resurrection and in Jesus present now in their neighbor. When we trust it, we find a joy, we find a freedom, a happiness, there's that word again, a happiness in letting go, in sharing, in learning to trust. Trust the risen Lord present in our fellow believers. See, the Easter effect means death does not own me anymore. And I can start learning to give myself away. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. For there the Lord has ordained His blessing, life, happiness. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able. And we're going to sing together the hymn 774, Leaning on the Everlasting Arm. We confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
Let us now pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Your church cries out, O God, and you listen. As you drew near to the disciples, even in the midst of their small, teetering faith, draw near to us in the middle of our own. Breathe on us your Holy Spirit, that our faith be renewed and our trust enlivened. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your creation cries out, O God, and you listen. Nurture trees, crops, and wildflowers, and all growing things. Guide farmers, ranchers, gardeners, foresters, and others who tend the soil and nurture plants to life in these days of spring's renewal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your world cries out, O God, and you listen. Guide police, firefighters, paramedics, and other first responders in their work for the well-being of communities and the dignity of every person, that no one may need to live in fear. Guide the leaders of nations with wisdom tempered by compassion for the sake of a world where all are fed and safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your children cry out, O God, and you listen. Hear your people crying out for justice, for an end to suspicion, mistrust, and oppression. May Easter have such an effect on us that fear of the unknown or the unfamiliar has no power over us. We pray for all who cry out today in suffering or pain, who await your restoration and healing of body, mind, or spirit. We pray especially for Noah as he undergoes treatment in Denver, and for Mitch whose treatments have been suspended for healing, for courage, for peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Accept our gratitude, O God, for the lives of those who now rest in you, those who taught us by example what trust looks like and who passed on to us what was from the beginning, what they had heard, what they had seen with their eyes, what they had looked at and touched with their hands concerning the word of life. As new heavens and a new earth were their hope, may it be ours as well. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to share God's peace with those around you in worship this morning. way back to your seats for the offering this morning. A reminder that all the monies collected in the Love Your Neighbor jar during these Sundays of April are going to benefit the Artemis House right here in Spearfish. And so I thank you in advance for your gifts that way. We receive the morning offering.
I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing together our offertory song. Let the vineyards be fruitful, Lord, and fill to the brim our cup of blessing. Gather a harvest from the seeds that were sown, that we may be fed with the bread of life. Gather the hopes and dreams of all, unite them with the prayers we are. Our table with your presence and give us a foretaste of the feast to come. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts towards those who hunger in any way that all may know your care and prepare us now to feast on the bread of life. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We invite all who have worshipped with us this morning and believe Jesus present in the bread and wine of this supper with new life and mercy for you to come forward and commune with us today or to come forward for a blessing. Please pick up a cup from the trays in the center aisle as you come forward unless you desire grape juice instead of the wine. It's already poured for you up in front. Just asking you to receive the juice instead. We also have gluten-free wafers available for those for whom that is a need. Again, just ask and you'll receive. The table is set. Let us eat and drink and be blessed together.
I invite you to stand as you're able to receive the blessing. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Amen. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us again through the healing power of this gift of life. Strengthen us now through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Christ is risen. Indeed. Hallelujah. Good to have you with us. So we go from the Sunday of the empty tomb to the Sunday of the empty pew. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. We well, Mother Nature, I guess. Uh, how many do we have online with us, Andy? 84, 85 households. Okay. Hi, everybody at home. Um, yeah, the weather kind of kind of scotched us, but we know that uh, this Sunday is usually a little less than the Sunday before, um, and that's okay. We had a wonderful Easter celebration here last Sunday. Easter continues now for 50 days, you know, to the day of Pentecost, so we continue to celebrate uh, the resurrection. I uh, don't have a lot of announcements for you, except two weeks from today we have our uh, annual congregational meeting. It's kind of, it's not the the budget meeting, it's the other stuff. So we elect new council members, receive the reports of our different ministries over the course of the year. The annual reports are printed there. I mean, there are some that are printed and they're on the usher's counter. As you exit today, you can pick one up if you like to peruse it. But we're having that meeting two weeks from today in between our worship services. So just kind of keep that in mind. And that's the same Sunday, by the way, that we will be receiving new members into our family of faith here at Our Savior's. Um, if you are not on that list and you're one of those who might like to consider membership with us here, we would love to know that and have your name and include you in that uh, celebration that day. Other than that, I, Beth, is there anything? Is there a senior ministry happening this Thursday? I think there might be. Yeah, at 11 o'clock in the morning? 10 o'clock in the morning. 10 o'clock in the morning, senior ministry uh, party here. Yes, Yes. Okay. Now, uh, if you'd like to take one of these lilies with you, if you're, you know, uh, you may do so after worship today. Um, we want to get rid of them all by Wednesday night. That... Oh, do we? Another? So should they take them today? Oh, okay. All right. Well, take them or don't. We're going to have lilies around for a while. I know how it goes around here, though, is that people are not excited about continuing to water lilies after a little bit of time. So, you know, if you can find a home for a lily, beautiful, take it with you, okay? Please stand to receive this blessing. <laughs> now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing our way out of worship this morning with hymn number... Which is it? I don't see it on the screen. 545. Lord, dismiss us with your blessing. Call us.
serve the Lord.